thank you for joining me this morning. I'm very pleased to participate in the Competitiveness Forum because I think that it is a key issue facing the Caribbean. And I thank the organizers for allowing me to share some of the research I've been doing on this topic. Even preparing, trying to compress a much larger paper into a 20 minute or a 30 minute presentation, I managed to gain a tremendous amount. I chose this topic because I think that in trying to improve the international competitiveness of the Caribbean, there is going to be a role for foreign direct investment. And I believe that one of the avenues which is open for foreign direct investment is China. I'm going to present this morning in five sections. First, I'll talk about Chinese foreign direct investment generally. Then I'll look at the status of Chinese FDI in the region. Then I'll turn to the mutuality of interest between China and the Caribbean. And fourthly, I look at the potential opportunities. And I close by looking at the prospects for Chinese foreign direct investment in the Caribbean. By way of introduction, let me mention two things. When I talk about um, foreign direct investment from China, I'm talking about the People's Republic of China and not Taiwan. When I talk about the Caribbean, I'm talking about those countries that have diplomatic relations with China because China encourages investment only with those countries. And as you know, representation in this region is split between China and Taiwan. The countries that have diplomatic relations with China are Antigua, Bahamas, Barbados, Cuba, Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, Jamaica, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago. While I have data for Cuba, I'm going to leave them out of this presentation because I don't have comparative details in the way that I have for the Caribbean. And also, Cuba, when you include Cuba in the gross investment figures, you get a, a big distortion. I also want to begin by distinguishing between foreign direct investment and investment. There is a, a, a huge literature which is growing exponentially about Chinese investment <laughs> in Latin America and the Caribbean. And here, all capital flows, whether loans or investment, are lumped together and described as investment. And when you look at that, you can get a significant distortion because uh, Chinese aid to Caribbean countries has also grown rapidly. But by conflating all of them under investment, it's very misleading. Let me turn now to uh, three points on Chinese foreign direct investment. As you know, China has grown most, more rapidly than any other country in recorded economic history over the last two or three decades. They have, in the last decade, become far more integrated into the global economy. In the early decades, they were the primary recipient of foreign direct investment. Now, they are becoming a source of foreign direct investment, especially for developing countries, and particularly in energy and raw materials. Some metrics on Chinese foreign direct investment. First of all, it's relatively new. It was only authorized by the state in 1979 as part of going global. The impetus for foreign direct investment emanates both from the engagement in the global economy, but also from a variety of internal sources. The state, obviously, but also at the enterprise level. You have a myriad of types of enterprises from private to fully state-owned to provisionally owned 
and all of them have motives and are relatively large compared to Caribbean countries. Chinese, what is called, outward foreign direct investment flows have increased every year in the last decade. And the data for 2006 to 2012 indicates an increase from 21 billion to 87 billion. It's a substantial, almost five times, four times increase in just six years. The stock of Chinese foreign direct investment is increasing quite dramatically. Take that as a global figure, it has moved from about 90 billion to over 500 billion globally. In 2012, Chinese foreign direct investment, however, accounted for only 6% of the global foreign direct investment uh, flows and only 2.3% of global stock of foreign direct investment. A second point that we need to note here is that investment decision making in China. This is important to note because this is very different from the traditional form of foreign direct investment which is done mainly by private firms. In China, the state dominates decision making about investment, including foreign direct investment. There is an active strategy of creating internationally competitive state-owned companies, many of them taking the form of multinational corporations. The centrally controlled state enterprises are responsible for 70% of foreign direct investment. A further 30% is uh, generated by state enterprises which are provisionally, uh, which are <coughs> provincially or regionally owned. And the rest, which is just about 2%, is, um, is undertaken by private enterprises. Approximately 87% of all China's foreign direct investment in Latin America and the Caribbean during the period 2000 to 2011 was undertaken by centrally owned state enterprises. One of the things that's important to note here then is that any foreign direct investment involving China has two aspects which need to be noted. First of all, it inevitably involves state-to-state -state relations. It's not purely a negotiation between the enterprise and the receiving countries, government, or private partners. The other aspect we need to note here is the sheer complexity of the institutional arrangements and the decision-making process. This is not merely there is a there is central planning, there is a central state, there are provisional and regional levels of governance, and you have a variety of enterprises. Some are fully owned, some are partly owned, some are mainly private, some are entirely private. So you have a, a really wide variety of enterprise forms that could be involved in foreign direct investment. However, whatever form these enterprises take, there is the overarching role of the state, and the state directs foreign direct investment, not only by planning and indicative policies, but through finance. And here we need to distinguish between A, financing their external activities through the China Development Bank or the Export Import Bank of China, and B, controlling those enterprises through the state-owned banking system. In other words, if the state wants to encourage raw material and foreign investment. It will make sure that the banking system provides the appropriate funding both internally and externally. And therefore, the state is behind in a controlling way. Um, the third aspect that we need to note here is that the, at the level of the enterprise, the drivers for Chinese foreign direct investment are pretty much the same as other foreign investors. However, in the case of the Caribbean, most of the, the investment has been raw material seeking 
rather than market seeking or efficiency seeking or strategic asset seeking. Indeed, the figures are aggregate for Latin America and the Caribbean, but to substantiate this point, 87% of Chinese foreign direct investment in this hemisphere is in raw materials or energy. Let me now turn to the status of Chinese foreign direct investment. And the first point we need to note here is the difficulty in quantifying the figures. First of all, the data that you have to go on is provided by the, the state in China. This data does not necessarily use the same definitions as commonly used in, say, the IMF or the World Bank. And the data is not complete. In addition, what is listed is almost entirely state investment. And a lot of private investment takes place which isn't recorded. In addition to all of this, there is a major distortion because a lot of the Chinese foreign investment goes through financial centers in the Cayman Islands and the British Virgin Islands. And if you look at investment, foreign direct investment in these countries, you see some huge figures, but they're really just passing through the banking system and there's no indication as to where they will go globally. And so you have to extract from any data that you get from China these deposits, which are, in some cases, returning to China. They're wrong tripping to get the benefit of being a foreign investor in China. So you have to take that out. So given all of that, what you have for direct foreign investment is rather tentative. Secondly, um, in the case of the Caribbean, if we exclude Cuba, in 2012, there was about 320 million of Chinese foreign direct investment. That is an increase from 75 million in 2003. And the largest recipient of that, largest stock of that investment is in Guyana with over 100 million, and in Suriname with about 80 million. Just to go back to the point of the uncertainty of data, if you read across the figures from the Chinese government, there was some real investment of about 56 million in the Bahamas in 2007, but in 2008 it is recorded as less than 1 million. So these, this data is difficult to interpret. Um, if you add Cuba to the picture, you're really adding about another 150 million to the figures. But I've taken that out because I don't have details on Cuba. So Chinese foreign direct investment in the Caribbean at this stage is very small, both as a share of China's outward foreign direct investment and as a share of total foreign direct investment in the region, which is largely dominated by US, Canada, and Europe. Let me now turn to an inventory of the projects I've been able to identify. And I, I don't want to say it's complete, but in this inventory, unfortunately, based on what I've been able to ascertain, the biggest single investment in the region from a Chinese source is a project of over two billion which was done by a firm from Hong Kong. It's a major port development in Freeport, an investment of about 2.6 billion. That's not included in the Chinese foreign direct investment. Um, there, has, there have been two investments in Guyana. One which is strictly private and small and, and is seeking a local market is a shipyard. The major investment has been by a private group from China in the bauxite industry. And uh, it is not clear that this investment is running at full capacity at this time. This is a raw, ma see raw material seeking investment. In Jamaica, um, and let me just mention that sometimes you have data that you cannot use publicly, you have to respect the confidentiality of it. 
So if I'm vain, that certain point, it's not because I'm uncertain about the accuracy. In the case of Jamaica, there is an investment in three sugar um, plantations and sugar factories. That is aimed both at external and internal market seeking. There has been uh, investment in road operations, the completion of a major highway which is going to be a toll road, and um, part of completing the financial arrangements involves um, some equity by virtue of assets provided by the government for this operation. Um, China, there's also been a major investment in palm oil production in Suriname, and that is intended for export to China. This is a raw material seeking investment and to export to China. Finally, and the details here are not as good as I would like, it is clear that two or three investments have been made in the search in the allocation of concessions for natural gas exploration in Trinidad. And, I want, and this is a raw material seeking investment which fits with China's global search for energy across the world. I want to mention one, what I call kind of investment, which is what I call inadvertent foreign direct investment, in that China does not invest in countries that have diplomatic relations with Taiwan. That includes the Dominican Republic. But a Chinese state enterprise bought a firm, a foreign firm, which has an equity in the Dominican Republic. So they are actually engaged in Dominican Republic in an inadvertent, but rather than deliberate way. And that's a, a very interesting possibility for those countries that are not um, giving diplomatic rec um, recognition to China. Okay, having looked at the inventory, let me now turn to what's the mutuality of interest. First of all, China's interest in the Caribbean. Why would China be interested in a small group of countries? Well, first of all, we have to know there are a range of enterprises in China. We tend to think of foreign direct investment as always multinational corporation. We have a range of smaller firms. And for some of the smaller firms, the Caribbean is an ideal environment to invest in because they're not multinational corporations. So once you understand there's a range of investors, you can understand there are always going to be firms, some quite small, who will be interested in investing in the Caribbean. I see five motives, and I'm really expanding Dunning's typology. First of all, there's market seeking in foreign direct investment. This is not going to be seeking Caribbean markets. It's going to be seeking export markets using the Caribbean as a production platform. Secondly, there is the traditional raw material motive, which is very strong in Chinese foreign direct investment. Thirdly, efficiency seeking, not likely, since we're not going to provide the kind of economies of scale. Fourthly, asset seeking, that hasn't happened yet, but I'll come back to that with the opportunity. And I want to mention a fifth one, which I'm adding here, which is um, debt recovery. The Chinese government has provided a considerable amount of aid to, to Caribbean countries. Many of these countries are already highly indebted, and this aid has to be paid back at some stage. One of the ways in which this indebtedness can be settled is by the transfer of assets, such as land. So I see this as a fifth form of investment, which is through debt recovery or debt repayment. Now, on the, um, okay, I want to mention one other special aspect of the Caribbean. Caribbean as an export platform, given the fact that it has preferential trade arrangements with a range of countries, Canada, Europe, etc. Um, I think this is a real possibility here because China faces real non-tariff barrier 
barriers to trade, but also faces prejudice. And um, sometimes a Chinese-made good coming through the Caribbean would be more acceptable than, and raise less hysteria about um, the local market being lost in Europe or in the United States. Turning to the receptivity of the Caribbean. Obviously, at this stage where growth is um, fairly fragile and at low rates, anything that can boost investment and foreign direct investment has traditionally played this role. I believe that while the Caribbean has benefited in the last decade from significant aid flows, that as the repayment becomes an issue, the Caribbean is going to turn more towards seeking foreign direct investment than more aid. Okay, the fourth section, potential opportunities. I think there are a myriad of opportunities. First of all, raw materials. There is natural gas, there is gold, there is bauxite, there are fish stocks, there are a whole range of raw materials, which China, timber, which China could be interested in. Uh, tourism, China will be the largest source of tourists in the world in 2012, and it is expected that they will be spending 120 billion annually by then. It would shock you to know that in a country that receives so many tourists, Jamaica, 2,200 Chinese tourists arrived in the country in 2012, which means we have really started to tap that market. Um, agriculture and forestry, Suriname, Belize, Ghana, very attractive food, um, important item for China. Um, China has been acquiring land, not the only country, but has been acquiring land in Africa for food production, and it's a possibility here. Construction, while it has been a service to date, I could see some of these countries incorporating locally to get the benefits of being a Caribbean firm rather than a Chinese firm doing structure. Infrastructure, roads and ports, and I'm sure you'll hear more about that later on. China has been a major investor in ports all across the world. Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Belgium, Greece, all over the place. So um, port expansion in the Caribbean is certainly going to be a possibility, especially given the synergies, potential synergies with the expansion of the canal in Panama. Education. Why should only U.S. firms be um, having universities. In China, the initiative may not come from China, it may come from institutions here who are seeking strategic alliances in advanced education. Manufacturing, a possibility for external markets. Health care, um, oriental medicine, rail and the mystique of it have been growing rapidly in the U.S. I could see that it would be easier for major establishments to service U.S. healthcare needs from Jamaica or the Bahamas or Barbados. Finally, real estate. Chinese investors, and there's now a, a group of rich investors in China, have been the main purchasers of upscale real estate across the world. We have some upscale properties in, um, in the Caribbean, especially in Barbados. I believe that this is a market we have not tapped. Let me turn to the final section, the prospects. There are about eight factors. It's not an exhaustive list, but there are about eight factors that would affect the prospects for these opportunities to be realized through foreign direct investment from China. First of all, diplomatic relations with China is still going to be a prerequisite. However, I raise the question that if there was a country that didn't recognize China, Taiwan but had oil and natural gas, I have a feeling that um, Chinese government would find a way to do business with that country. Based on experience in Africa, 
In addition, I mentioned already the inadvertent foreign direct investment where you buy a global company, which is say an Australian mining company, and then you find out that they have a stake in Guyana or, or Suriname or somewhere. But so that's the first one. And that relates to whether countries who are now beneficiaries of development aid from Taiwan would make what I think would be a good strategic decision. I believe ultimately the future is weighted towards the People's Republic rather than Taiwan. I would hazard a guess, and I hope this won't be attributed to me, but I would speculate that eventually, given the close and growing integration between Taiwan and China, that they will find some sort of autonomous relationship with China. But I would think that strategic long-term thinking would require that you throw in your lot early with China. Remember something, relations with China is not the same as relations with the West. This is a different culture, a different concept of time, and so on. You can't just sign up today and start to draw down development day tomorrow. You have to develop that relationship. Okay, the second one is China's promotion of foreign direct investment. There are already 13,000 Chinese overseas enterprises in 127 countries. The plan, the current plan, which runs, I think, 2012 to 2015, <coughs> is intensifying the push for foreign direct investment. So I think it's certainly going to escalate and to continue. Thirdly, the business environment in the Caribbean. Investment goes where it is easiest to do business. And the recent reports of doing business and the competitiveness um, indices indicate that compared to other developing countries, that the Caribbean is a relatively difficult environment in which to do business. It's far easier to do business in many other developing countries. Recent um, research paper by the IDB found that if you compare the Caribbean with other small developing countries who would be our natural competitors for attracting Chinese foreign investment, that it's far more difficult to do business in the Caribbean. So there's room to improve the business environment. Fourthly, there's going to be a learning process. Chinese firms coming here have to learn about how to deal with labor relations, learn about culture in the Caribbean, and so on. But on our side, there's also a learning relationship. The negotiators, I won't call any countries, but the negotiators with one Chinese investment were surprised that the investors had more data about the local conditions than the local team had. So there's going to be a learning process on both sides. Um, the Chinese political system and governance system is a complex thing which you have to learn if you're going to understand how to do business and get investments. <coughs> a fifth one is the foreign direct investment policies of the Caribbean. Many Caribbean countries have bilateral investment treaties and double taxation avoidance agreement, but they're all hopelessly out of date. It's just an example of if you want to get investment, and you're going to pursue policies. There are things like upgrading and updating your bilateral investment treaties, um, getting them into place. You also have to look at if there are going to be any sectoral investment restrictions. For example, when the Chinese tried to invest in ports in New Jersey and California, the US government blocked it on security grounds. We may not have those concerns in the Caribbean, but there may be some areas where people would want not to have Chinese investment. For example, no country's name, but a lot of people have been criticizing Chinese investors as being not sensitive to the environment. Um, you know, there may be some, there's some reality in this, but there's also a lot of misinformation in this. Um, some people might say, well, we don't want Chinese investment in, say, beach property because it will destroy the beach. My answer to that is an investor is an investor is an investor, okay? All of them need to be encouraged and all of them need regulation 
to become good corporate citizens. I don't see a Chinese firm as any different from an American in terms of how they're going to operate. Um, six, very interesting and important, what I call transnational ethnic business networks. China is not just an economy. It's a civilization and it's a global economic network. Chinese citizens all over the world are still plugged in to family ties and other networks in China. And that is one of the reasons why there is friction between what I call settler type investors, where the investor comes and stays, lives in the country. For example, in Africa and in some parts of the Eastern Caribbean, there have been friction because new Chinese traders are seen to have an advantage, not only in language, but in connection with sources in China, and therefore have a competitive edge which puts local traders out of business. And it's been caused a lot of friction in Nigeria and I think in Antigua. Point being that there are these transnational, global, ethnic networks. They can be an advantage as well as they can be a problem. Seven, potential non-economic frictions. There's nationalist sentiment, and there's xenophobia, there's racism, there's prejudice. Whenever you get a new group making progress in the global economy, there are always a lot of disparaging remarks. When Japan started to make cars, people were saying, well, they have a lawn more engine, and they're not going to last, and now they're making some of the best cars. You're going to inevitably hear that Chinese products are not as good, they're not going to last, they're cheap, they're, and so on. Much of this is just misinformation. All I'm making a plea for here is that there may be substance, there may be misinformation. Just saying, let's approach this thing in a balanced way and understand and not be prejudiced. One of the problems we have in the Caribbean is that in countries where people of Chinese descent are integrated into the region, Nobody, it's not a problem. But in some countries where there have been few Chinese, the moment there are a couple extra Chinese people settling there, a hysteria develops. For example, um, I'm not describing this as hysteria, I'm merely citing an issue. The US and Bahamas are very concerned about construction workers from Chinese companies that remain in the Bahamas. Mahamas are concerned about a new outside population, but the U.S. is concerned that eventually these people are coming to the U.S. So there are all these non-economic things that can cause some friction. Final point here, number eight, is the experience of the early investors, what I call vanguard companies, is very important. If they succeed, if they're profitable, if they have a good investment experience, that's the best advertisement. If they find difficulties, prejudice, or as we have been seeing in the Jamaican papers, Chinese business community, whether resident or new, they right, feel that like they're extra targeted by crime, all of these things, the experience of the vanguard investor is going to be very important as to whether more investors come or not. Let me conclude and stay on schedule, Mr. Chairman, um, by making five not very exciting points. One is, at the moment, foreign direct investment from China is limited. Two, it's likely to increase because China is going global. And thirdly, we have strong interest in China, matched by our own interest in getting more investment from any source, including China. For there are opportunities in a wide range of sectors. And um, properly nurtured, I think Chinese foreign investment could fill some of those. And finally, the relationship with China. I want to make a plea which 
goes beyond just investment. Obviously, China, the center of gravity of the global economy, is switching towards the East. And uh, I believe that in dealing with China, and to the same extent to other countries in Asia, you have to learn the culture. It's a different political system. It's a different uh, <coughs> culture. You can't deal with it in the same way that you have dealt with Washington, London, and Brussels. <coughs> and I, I want to be sure that we understand this and that we take this into account. And I leave you with this illustration. We are fond of quoting the so-called Chinese proverb that we want to live in interest, interesting times. There is no such proverb. There can, cannot be traced anywhere in China. <laughs> but it is the kind of superficial understanding that we have of China. And I'm suggesting that we have to get to know this country. This is a unique civilization. Most countries can tell you when the country was formed. China's origins has just always been there. It's not a country, it's a civilization. The political system is neither capitalist nor socialist. All of this you have to learn because foreign direct investment is embedded in a much wider relationship. And I want to be sure that we are dealing with it properly in the Caribbean. Um, that's the best way I can, and safest way I can say about the nature of our relations with China at this time going forward. Mr. Chairman, I'm adhering to my time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Bernal, for an extraordinarily interesting presentation. Uh, Indira, I don't know how much time um, we have um, 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go on. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have 10 to 15 minutes, and I'm just, I certainly have a lot of questions, but I'm, I'm going to forego my questions for those from the floor. Uh, can we, uh, Richard, shall we take two or three questions? And I'm in your hands. Okay, please. Mor morning. Can you give me a name when you? Yeah, Michael Edwards. Uh, Ambassador, is there anything in your research or information being otherwise that suggests that the Chinese maybe have looked at the Spanish experience here and might be looking at um, those kind of large scale hotel investments? <laughs> Can we have a couple more? Keith Nurse. essentially been, well, uh, where is the value added? Where is the local contribution? Um, and how does it impact on it, our economies? And in this regard, the recent literature on uh, Chinese investment in Caribbean and in Latin America generally has raised tremendous concerns about what we could call uh, the commodity trap, which is that in effect, um, Chinese investment is largely going into the material, raw material areas, as you've identified, um, close to 87%, I think, if I recall correctly, in your presentation. Um, so I think there's a major concern. There's also the concern of what we call the industrialization, which is, um, as you will be familiar, um, uh, I forget the author's name, who's written mm -hmm. about the, the, um, the dragon in the room. Um, that 90% of what can be produced in Latin America and the Caribbean can be produced cheaper in China and exported here. Um, and so, um, throughout the region, and there's a tremendous concern that, um, yes, there's Chinese investment, uh, but the Chinese imports uh, is having a significant impact in terms of deindustrialization of the region. Can we, can we be tight, please? 
Yeah. And the last point is, um, some of our, our countries in the region have some Chinese populations from since the 19th century. Is that Chinese diaspora some, um, does it give us a leg up? Uh, you know, China's first foreign minister yeah. was Trinidadian and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Carlo, here's your baby. Pietro Reddy from the IDB. Uh, it wasn't planned, but my question is very related to what Professor Nurse was asking. And that has to do with the, the benefits from uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, I, I like very much your, your presentation and your overview about the potential and the, the present situation of FDI investments in, uh, um, in Latin America and the Caribbean from, from China. Uh, what I wonder is, uh, given that most of these investments go to natural resources and natural resources exploitation, and a key issue in my mind is uh, to what extent uh, foreign investments can generate linkages with the local economy and can generate opportunities for uh, the development of local providers, the exchange of uh, technology and knowledge, the transfer of good practices, all factors that end up benefiting the local economy. Uh, what's your assessment in terms of you know, the impact of Chinese investments in raw materials? And can governments do anything in this regard? OK, thanks. Um, there's always the question and answer is always very important. <laughs> On the hotel investments, um, no interest to date, no interest yet in um, air links. Mm -hmm. But if we get Japanese tourists coming this far, we certainly can get Chinese. We have not, we have not educated the Chinese consumer. Right now, most travel from China, which is a new phenomenon, is going to elsewhere in Asia, some of which are tropical locations, right. and to Europe for culture and history and so on. It is for us to make the runnings. Um, I think once that happens, you will have Chinese investors. The second possibility is Chinese investors investing in global hotel chains, even where there may be no Chinese tourists. Um, I can see them, I could see them, a Chinese firm acquiring an already established global hotel chain, which could be in the Caribbean. It's something to come, I believe. Um, on the foreign direct investment, which is a multiple warhead, Keith, there are about four things you asked. First, the costs and benefits. When I said there were eight factors, there really is a ninth factor, which is in the, in the longer paper, which I call the partnership. What you get out of foreign investment is a matter of the, how you supervise it and your regulatory regime, what sectors you choose to open under what condition. And I have a, a long section which I should have included here talking about how do you ensure that the recipient country becomes a net beneficiary. This, as you say, is a question, an open question of all kind of foreign direct investment. And my answer to it is that you have to set the conditions to make sure that your receiving country is a net beneficiary. Um, commodity trap. Clearly, this is a possibility for the commodity exporting countries of the region, as it has been in Latin America. China is now the leading trade partner for Peru, uh, Chile, Brazil, based on commodity exports. And uh, it has led to a reversion of moving towards manufacturing and industrialization back to commodity export. In the short run, it has boosted economic growth in those countries during the global economic crisis. But as a long-term thing, I think it's detrimental. It is for these countries to stop exporting the raw product and start to process it and export the final product to China. And, I mean, you would think that by now in Latin America they've learned this lesson over the last 100 or 200 yeah. years. <laughs> so it's not about, if the Chinese, if you allow them, yes, they'll come and buy the raw material, but if you want to sell to that market, produce it in the more advanced form. Um, the industrialization is not a threat from investment, it's a threat from trade. 
It's real. It's happening. And in the, uh, this is not an advertisement. In a longer work, which is shortly to appear <laughs> on China Caribbean relations, I have dealt with that issue because it's a very real threat for a country like Trinidad. Importation of less expensive Chinese manufactured goods. It's a threat. It has certainly happened in Mexico, particularly in apparel and elsewhere. Ironically, wages in China are no longer the lowest in the world. And China is now farming out to places like Vietnam and Ethiopia, manufacturing to low wage countries from China to low-wage <laughs> countries. So the whole ball game is changing. Um, population. This is what I meant by the transnational ethnic net business networks. It's an asset because there is a comfort level for a person from China. That's the 2,000 tourists that come here, 90% of them stay in homes. It means they're visiting family or friends. This network is real. And indeed, because of this comfort, some of the projects which have been brought, some realized and some that haven't been realized, were being shopped by um, part of the resident Caribbean Chinese population. For example, a Jamaican Chinese citizen living in Canada was the main interlocutor in trying to get a Chinese firm to buy into the bauxite industry. So the network is global, and it's, it's a plus. Um, the linkages, very important. This is an issue for all foreign direct investment. If you set the right conditions and you get them to linkages backward into the economy to source supplies here, etc. It will be beneficial, but this is a question not confined to the Chinese. It's a question, for example, foreign ownership, American ownership of hotels, you know, accused of not buying local furniture, not buying local culture. It's an issue. It's going to be an, in, an issue for any foreign direct investor. That's why that last section that I didn't present about the partnership, the terms and conditions that you set, because you don't just want any foreign investor. You want the right kind of corporate citizen. You want a company that's going to transfer know-how. These are some of the externalities that benefit from getting foreign direct investment. But we have been in the game of foreign investment forever. We were present at the birth of the global economy. We've been in this thing for 500 years. We should by now have an idea what conditions you want foreign investors to operate under, OK? Going back to the um, Pat Northover from Solisis, I want to thank you for, as usual, very um, insightful and, and, and fantastic presentation on, the, on the, the command of the intricacies of a very, very difficult topic. And I'm glad you raised issues of partnership. Um, I kind of have three questions. Um, first one was really, you said we have a long history of a relationship with foreign direct investment being at the presence of globalized um, international relations, emergence of capitalism. But how do you negotiate with a new global hegemon? I mean, our experiences have always been that we get the short end of the stick. So China, with a very difficult record internationally in terms of hard negotiations for its, its, its own benefit. I wanted to draw attention also to regulatory gaps that exist that you mentioned, and whether or not partnership couldn't exist there, for example, supporting training and development in key regulatory agencies. But I wanted to caveat that with um, the experiences within the sugar industry. Um, well, as you know, the Compliant Group has been in, in, in Jamaica, but one of the main challenges in its entry here has been actually situating itself within our domestic regulatory environment. There's a long history of conflict in the sugar industry, which meant that we have built up very robust institutions, even if at some price in terms of still underlying conflict or uncertainties that may exist among the partners. But one of the difficulties of having um, a new entrant here has been 
uh, willing, uh, unwillingness to fit in to the existing regimes of governance and a, a more of a desire to go it alone. Um, in terms of negotiations again and regulatory frameworks, the third question is, um, could you envision a win-win possibility in international trade negotiations? You have been spearheading the issue of recognition of vulnerability of small island states as a category um, to facilitate the terms and benefits within special and differential treatment. Is it possible that we could have a kind of partnership, the Caribbean bloc, with or other small island states, which, as you know, in terms of WTO power, we have much more efficacy in terms of counting our nation states. Um, could we have a deal with the Chinese to get that on the agenda in a serious way and to allow for that to inform things like the updating of our investment treaties? There's a problem that obviously the Chinese won't necessarily want to put them in a position where they have to recognize the fragility of the ecosystems or the environmental context. So the last question is really, is that a feasible win-win option for, for the region? Thanks. Thank you, good morning. My name is Sharif Apollo from UV Consulting. Um, we actually have a table to our left, so for our colleagues who have not yet visited, I invite you to do so. Just stole a moment here. Um, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Banal. And just two very quick questions. One on the issue of um, subsidies which may or may not be given to, to Chinese companies and the possible impact if there may be on our own local um, producers and you know if you could just comment on that if you can. The second question pretty much relates to what the former um, speaker mentioned and also in your summation of your last response which pertains to investment and the, the framework which is created regionally I know that there has been a CARICOM investment call um, being tossed around for quite a bit of years <laughs> with very little movement. Um, you mentioned the fact that individual countries have bilateral investment treaties, have double taxation agreements, but there is no uniform CAR CARICOM or CAR CARIFORM or Caribbean approach to really marshal the investment. You mentioned the fact that how do you now determine or encourage or require firms, for example, to, for, for there to be technology transfer, um, for there to be some level of corporate social responsibility. And my question really is, uh, to what extent do you believe that the region really needs to get to the point of pursuing a harmonized investment policy and investment code? And will that actually have an impact on us being able to harness the best of our investment opportunities with partners such as not exclusive, not limited to, but with partners such as China. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to stick in a third question. Okay. Uh, you have spoken about you spoke about China almost as you know uh, for sitting out there, waiting, uh, looking for eclectic or you know of serendipity almost. Is there is there a Chinese strategy for the Caribbean? Uh, it, it seems to me that certainly in in, in the whole port area and in the shipping area. That if you, if you look at what China is doing, you can discern the elements of an overall strategy. Um, uh, uh, in Shadow Ramos, they seem to be moving in the direction of, of ship repair. Uh, in, in, in Jamaica, the Goat Island thing seems to be as though this is where they want their port to be. Um, uh, there's the Bahamas thing, which I say is Hong Kong. But, uh, and there's a, 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 I think in Panama, I think, I think China, Harbor is working, is, is doing the Colon um, um, container port. Is there an overall strategy, and um, to what extent have uh, we, we, we taken a, a sort of universal, comprehensive approach to this in terms of how we in turn, turn strategize our, our approach to China? Okay, let me begin the first um, round first group of questions. Uh, A, the terms. B, the regulatory, the possibility for collaborative regulatory action. Thirdly, the sugar industry. And fourth, the partnerships. 
I'm going to suggest to you that the experience of the Caribbean countries is that they, when they collaborate for external negotiations, they have been successful. I'm not talking about the deeper negotiations. <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> for example, when Jamaica engaged the multinational corporations in the bauxite industry in the 70s, they put a very good team together and they were successful in getting a levy. I therefore maintain that if the Caribbean as a group, they will be stronger. And if they put together the right team, they can help to set the terms of the engagement. They can be more effective in controlling the regulatory environment. Um, I believe that that is possible. The one thing I would say is that the Caribbean is in a difficult economic situation. And when you're in a difficult economic situation, you must never, never relinquish. You mustn't be too anxious. You mustn't just be so anxious that you want to sell this asset or you want to get rid of this state enterprise. And just you're so anxious and desperate financially that you're just going to let it go. That's the thing to avoid. Even if you're desperate, don't let that show in your negotiations. So, and I've seen some anxiety in the Caribbean. The anxiety to get things done, resorting to certain initiatives which uh, I'm not fully in support of. Um, sugar industry, learning experience on both sides, both for us and for the investor. I would commend all foreign investors, Chinese or Americans, and you come into an environment which is not yours historically, culturally, institutionally. That you need to get local advisors. Many of the issues need never arise if you have the appropriate local advice. Issues with trade unions need not arise if you, you don't know the culture. You get somebody who knows it and you pay them to make sure you have good um, worker relations and so on. You should do that anywhere for any foreign investor. Um, partnerships, definitely a possibility. Definitely, we, that's what I mean when I, my section that I didn't elaborate about partnerships. We have to see them not just as coming in, but strategic partners, for example. You should be encouraging each investor that comes in from China to have a strategic business alliance with a local counterpart so that your, your, local, in, in your local private sector doesn't get squeezed out but gets included and goes global through that connection. Um, subsidies. Um, what, we, what incentives including subsidies we offer to investors. Uh, we have to be very careful with that because if you, you do too much of that, you lose the, it offsets the potential benefits. I think the literature also shows now that it's more important to have a competitive, a globally competitive business environment where it's easy and predictable to do business rather than giving incentives. Why? Everybody else gives a bit more, because we're all in developing countries competing for scarce foreign, well not scarce, but competing for foreign investment. And that leads me to the regional. Yes, we have to put in place the regional. Clearly, if we negotiate as a region, there are benefits. But I want to come back to avoiding competing. What happens is that, and it happened in I don't want to call names, but there are several industries which are regional and require a regional approach. And, there's a, and what happens is that the countries in the Caribbean compete, they keep lowering the bar. They're competing against each other. And that if, if you keep lowering the bar, eventually you don't, you don't get anything in the country. You might have got the investment instead of the other Caribbean countries, but you don't get the benefit. So, we have to avoid the destructiveness of competitive lowering of the bar. Um, China strategy. <clears throat> China has a political strategy in the region, which is China would clearly like to see um, 
all countries relinquish their diplomatic recognition of Taiwan. <laughs> this is what I mean about knowing the country. One of the preoccupations of Chinese history is that the country must never be divided. And therefore, they're never going to give up the Taiwan issue. You, it's not all about oil while there's a friction in the South China Sea. It's about national pride. And if you don't know that history, you're not going to give it up. So there is a political strategy. We're going to give more and more aid. We're going to be good friends. Pat's point is, can we turn that to advantage? Yes, we can. For example, you want a few big friends, not just Canada and the EU and the US. You want a few big friends like Brazil, India, China. We're batting for your issues in the WTO, like small economies, you want them to bat for climate change. We need some big friends. But part of that trade off, we have diplomatic recognition with you and not with Taiwan. Well, part of that is that you're going to give us some of your weight and so on. That's how it goes. No, there's a political strategy for the region. There's not an economic strategy from the region, which is distinct from a general global search for raw materials and investment outlets. Because the export-driven phase of China's trade is running into external and internal constraints. Now, is there anything wrong with it, but it's not going to perform the same way. The way to overcome that is what is being recommended to China is that they should consume more and save less, which is a dangerous recognition, uh, recommendation. But their answer is invest out. Go into the global economy, not just in trade, but in investment. And um, there's not a distinctive economic strategy for the Caribbean. I want to end by saying that one of the things the Caribbean has to realize is that you're small, you don't have a lot of resources, you're not of great strategic value. You're not automatically on anybody's agenda. Not the US, not the EU, not the UK, you're not automatically on anybody's agenda. In fact, the Green Hand Editorial recently saying that, imagine the Obama administration isn't paying any attention to the Caribbean. Well, you have to get on somebody's agenda, especially when there's a global power. However, the point with China is that while there's a China-Taiwan dispute, there'll be high interest. What the region must worry about is, if there's an accommodation, as there was a couple years ago between Taiwan and China, that they wouldn't compete. It hasn't held, but if there's such an accommodation, would China lose interest in the region? What would that imply for aid flows? And that is why I'm saying that don't assume aid flows at that level indefinitely. If the Taiwan-China thing goes in a certain direction, maybe China will lose interest as some other global powers have lost interest in the region. And that is why I'm saying maybe this is the time to look at what you can get from investment rather than from aid. There is no limit to investment. There is a limit to aid. If there is no strategic relationship, aid will dry up. There will always be some aid. Every global power has to be everywhere and has to have influence everywhere. But are we in the halcyon days of Chinese aid? And if so, what happens? if this is a phase.